For our scripture reading this morning, we are straying a little bit from the lectionary. We're sticking with the Gospels. We're going to be looking over the next seven weeks at the Gospel of John. Within that Gospel, we have the I Am statements of Jesus, such as, I am the bread of life, like today's reading, or I am the light, or I am the true vine. Uh, there's seven of them, and we'll be looking over the next seven weeks at these various statements. It is the Easter season, and this is appropriate time for us to renew our relationship with Jesus Christ, the living Lord, the risen Christ, in our lives. And so as we try to renew who we are in Jesus Christ, it is appropriate for us to uh, look at these statements, I feel, for us to see who God is and who we are in God in these. As we consider I am, this is the name of God. Uh, the Hebrew people knew this from uh, Moses. When Moses was encountering God in the burning bush and God says, free my people from Egypt, Moses said, okay, but tell me, who is it that is sending me? And God said, tell them, I am sent you. And I am is the name of God. So when Jesus says, I am the bread of life, it's a connection with God. And we understand that as Christians of who we are in God with these statements. That being said, I invite you to hear the first of these. It's from chapter 6, verses 1 through 14, and then 32 through 35. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many people? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, Gather up the fragments left over so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they had filled twelve baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, This indeed, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Then Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. And let us pray. Oh, gracious and loving God, as we meditate on your word this morning, as we consider who you are for us, as we think about the bread of life, we had asked at this time, give us nourishment to our spirits, our souls, that this time would help define us, that we may identify ourselves as people of the bread. We pray all these things in Christ's holy name. Amen. I want to say, growing up, uh, my sister moved out early from our home. She was 12 years older than me, and she got married when I was very young, and they, they moved out and started their own life together, and eventually made their way to Portland, Oregon. And they lived there for a while, then moved on to Seattle. And so growing up, I can remember we spent uh, a lot of our summers or vacation time going out and visiting the Northwest Coast, seeing my sister and her family, her husband and her children. And it was a wonderful time. There was a lot to do and see up there. I still remember the first time I went to the wharf in Seattle, Washington, uh, going out on the docks there. The smells, of, as you, you smell it, the sea air and the fishy smell, maybe some of the oils that, you, that they have there, and the sounds of seagulls and things. 
I remember when we, the first time I walked up on that wharf and walking down those docks, and it was kind of evening time, and there were people fishing right there off the pier, and, and I remember seeing a guy pull up a crab on his line, and it was uh, still alive, and seeing that, and it's just, my eyes are real big, and thinking, wow, this is cool, because you, know, you don't have that kind of thing in Oklahoma as far as uh, growing up in Oklahoma. So that was a neat experience. It was kind of cool, even though it was summertime in the evening and as the sun was setting, and we went into one of those little restaurants there on the wharf, and it was a fish place, and I remember eating clam chowder for the first time. Now, I didn't know if I was gonna like clam chowder, but when I tasted it, it was delicious, I loved it, and with that clam chowder, they served hot sourdough bread. Oh, it was delicious. I had never had sourdough bread either. The butter kind of melts into the crust and you taste that sour taste, the sourdough, and it was just, oh, it was, it was heavenly. And I don't know, as I think back on that, if it was part of the time that I spent with my parents there making that special or, or the excitement of seeing my sister again, but whatever it was, it all combined to really uh, make a special time for me so that when I think of bread, really good bread, if you want to say, what's your favorite, I think of sourdough. And I think of that time when I was a child. And today, if I eat sourdough, I can still sometimes, not every time, sometimes it has a little magic to it. You know, it takes you back. And tastes can do that to us. They transport us to other places. And for me, sourdough bread does that. I still, I still love it. Well, as we look at Jesus as the bread of life for who we are, it's important for us to understand this idea of sustenance. Now, for me, bread was a comfort. But for the Hebrew people, Bread was life-sustaining, life-giving. And so when Jesus says, I am the bread of life, and we think of that as, as sustenance for us, what does that mean for us as Christians? What does that mean for us to know Jesus as the bread of life? I think as we think of our daily need and sustenance and what we need, that comes each and every day to us. And so we trust that we'll have enough when we get up. So for us... I think the bread of life has a lot to do with us trusting in Jesus to be there for us even when we don't experience the presence of God. Sometimes we know that Jesus is there and it's a wonderful celebration time. Other times in our lives we may not quite be so sure that God's really there for us. Sometimes we go through valleys where we experience God's absence more than God's presence. It's important for us to be people of faith and to realize that God is there lifting us up, sustaining us through those times. I remember when I was uh, serving another church, I went to visit. There was this family that I went to visit, a little girl in the hospital. Uh, the family was very active in church, and uh, it started with the older teenage daughter. And she came all the time and was there whenever the doors were open. She came, started coming with the youth group, and her parents were a little slower to come. They probably thought, we don't know who this young, weird minister is that our, our daughter seems to like. And, but uh, they, they started coming around, too. And I remember the younger girl, the younger sister, was going into the hospital for a, a surgery. And something fairly minor. And uh, it may have been tonsils out or something like that. But it wasn't a life-threatening thing. They weren't worried. But I went there to visit with the family and have prayer with them. And we visited for a while. And... And it was getting time for the surgery, and I was getting ready to go. So I asked her before I left, I said, would you like me to pray with you uh, before I go? And she looked at me, and she said, no, I don't think so. And I was kind of shocked. I said, that was a first for me, and so I wasn't expecting that. But I said, okay. And said, oh, I wished her uh, the best for successful surgery and, and parted ways with the family and left. And and later I called the mother and asked her about that and asked her just to check on the surgery, see how it went, it all went great. But then I said, well, what happened about when I asked about prayer? I said, and she said she didn't want me to pray for it. Had I done something to uh, disturb her or, or anything like that? She said, no. She said, I wondered that myself. And so I asked her after you left, I said, why didn't you want Sam to pray for you? And she said, she looked at me and she said, well, we prayed for Uncle Henry and he died. <laughs> So, sometimes our experience of God is such that it's not, it doesn't lead us to trust. And we have these times when we experience maybe God's absence. Now, I do want to say that uh, it wasn't me, that I wasn't the one praying for Uncle Henry on that. So I just wanted to be assured of that in case you worry about me showing up at the hospital uh, when you're having surgery. But that sense of God's 
absence comes to all of us from time to time. And we have sometimes doubts that come and assail us during these low times, and that can be frustrating. And so how do we engage Jesus as the bread of life even during these valleys? It may be easy when we're on the mountain peak, but how do we do it in the valleys? It's our faith that tells us and informs us that we believe that God has good things in mind for us. Good things for our lives. That God wants blessing for us each and every day. That God wants us to experience that. And the fundamental trust in Jesus springs up in us as we encounter Jesus on a more daily basis. I believe that Jesus as the bread of life is a daily kind of trust. And we, we look at this idea of manna that comes from uh, the second part of our reading today where Jesus talks about manna in the desert. He said it wasn't from Moses, it was from God. And you remember what he's referring to is that story when they were wandering in the desert, all the Israelites were following Moses for 40 years out there. And you remember at the beginning they began to get hungry. There wasn't enough to eat. And they wanted food, and, and they grumbled and complained. And so Moses began to pray to God, and, and they began to receive manna. It was bread from heaven. They'd wake up, and they'd be able to gather this manna and bread and have enough to eat each day. Now, do you remember what the rules were for that? You weren't supposed to gather up any more than you could eat that day. And if you gathered up more, like if you gathered up manna for the next day, it would spoil and rot. And then the next day it would stink. And so, you know, if you're walking around and you smell something coming out of one of the tents, you would know which Israelites were greedy. And you'd say, aha, you gathered up too much, didn't you? Huh? No, that robes, you know, we had a hard day working yesterday. I'm sure that's all it is. You know, this idea. But so what that led to was this idea the next day we had to gather more. And it leads to a daily trust in God for our daily living. What that means is, as we experience God on a daily basis, we can begin to look for the long haul. Because we know that God's going to be there for us each and every day. And as we look with vision that's long rather than short, even when we pray for someone who dies, we recognize that Jesus, even for them, is still the bread of life. And they have begun a new journey in Christ and a new understanding of what it means to be fulfilled by that bread. And so as we gain a longer vision of life in Christ with our relationship with Jesus, we begin to have that sense of trust that begins to enter into our lives and overflow from us and spill out into our relationships with others. Now, there was a... A girl named Allison who was growing up, and she grew up with her brother Brad. Her brother Brad was adopted, and they had a wonderful childhood together and grew up together, a wonderful life together. And when Brad got older, he found out that he had a biological sister that he didn't even know about. And he discovered that, and he told his mother about it. And he was very excited to find this link to his past that he didn't know about, and it's kind of neat to find out somebody that biologically is tied to you that you didn't know about. And so he told his mother, she wasn't as excited about it as he was, but she was still happy for him. And she told Allison, and when she told Allison, Allison was not subdued really as much as she was ticked off. Uh, she saw it as kind of like that, who is this girl coming up? Is she gonna try to replace me? You know, she can't do that. You know, this is our, this is what we had. We were brother and sister. You guys can't be brother and sister. That's my job to be your sister. And as, as they uh, kind of engaged in this relationship, this new relationship with this other sister, Brad brought her to the house to show her around, and Allison wasn't too sure about this. And so when they were showing her around outside, they're walking around the pool outside, Allison shoves her into the swimming pool. And, you know, she said, she claimed that, well, you know, I'm just trying to make her feel like one of us, you know, because that's what we do around here. You know, the, the rest of the family wasn't believing it either. And, then, and Brad didn't buy it. He took Allison off by herself to talk to her. And, you know, he said, you know, she cannot take a single minute of what we have built together. Because what we have built together, this relationship that we have, 
has grown through a lifetime of being together. That's a wonderful allegory for our understanding of God's love for us. This relationship that we have in Christ has come before we even were aware of it, in God's provenient grace that comes to us, and it has come to us throughout our lives, and God has been there each and every day, and sometimes we don't always engage in Jesus as the daily bread, but God has been there trying to engage in us each and every day. It's wonderful how that works and how that spills over into our lives and how when we receive, we receive more than we need and the blessing overflows. And when we deepen our relationship with Jesus Christ, sometimes we come to this understanding that as we realize we do trust in Christ and we do trust in Jesus, and we may begin to realize maybe Jesus is trying to trust in us. What does that mean for Jesus to begin to trust in me or you? Dennis Weaverly tells about this. He says that sometimes um, you get a call from a church member. You know, sometimes this happens. A church member will call you up and, they, and you may be wary of this. And they call you because they don't normally call you. And they call you and they begin to chit-chat a little bit. You know, talk about how things going, you know. Oh, well, pretty good. You know, and really what you're wondering is why are you calling? But you don't say that, you, know, you do the chit-chat, and finally they confess, and they say, well, what I really called you about <laughs> is this. And it could be any number of things. I, 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 we'd like you to sing in the choir, or we'd like you to be an usher. We'd like you to teach Sunday school, or serve on this committee. We'd like you to be a UMW leader, or we've got youth camp coming up, and we need sponsors for that to go and attend. Vacation Bible schools right around the corner. We need an activities director for that. It could be any number of things in the church. And as you, you hear that, oh my goodness, and they ask you the weight of whatever it is falls upon you. And you, you may think, my goodness, they're really scraping the bottom of the barrel, aren't they? Or you may not think that this is Edmund. Probably what you're really thinking is, I don't have time for any of this. You know, I, look at my schedule as it is. I'm running from here to there. I make myself coming and going. And so then all the excuses begin to come and you can pick them off the tree like low-hanging fruit. And they're all good ones, logical reasons why you can say no, <laughs> no. It could be something else. It could be a friend that calls up, maybe not a friend, let's say acquaintance. Somebody from church that calls you that you don't really know well, but they contact you and you're wondering why they're calling. And, and then they, they wonder if you can go to lunch with them. And you might think, well, we know each other okay, but I don't know if we're lunch friends, you know. <laughs> I don't know if we're ready for that step. And they say, you know, I, I really have a need in my life. I, I have this issue that I'd like to share with someone, and I don't know who to share it with. And I know you from church, and I, I was hoping it would be you. And you may think, oh my goodness, I'm not ready for this. I don't have any kind of counseling background. What a, why are they calling me? Why me? It could be another issue. It could be somebody that you know that's a friend that has signs of addiction that you've seen kind of here and there. And you're wondering about their life, if they're really okay. Or it could be a child as a na in your neighborhood that you see markings on them or bruises that seem a little bit too consistent. And you wonder how their home life is. Personally, the easiest thing for us to do would just be to step out of it, mind our own business, and just say, forget it. We don't have time or energy or resources for any of these things. I mean, really, if you think about our time and energy, all we've really got to give are these five little barley loaves and these two scrawny fish. And after all, Jesus, what could you expect to do with that? I wonder, what could we really expect Jesus to do with that? The resources that we might have to offer, could it be that Jesus is somehow trusting in me? Could it be that Jesus is somehow trusting in you? And as we respond to the grace of Jesus, the call of Jesus in our lives, we might find that we do have these resources and that they're overflowing and the blessings rebound upon us and we find that we, we have enough. We have enough. As we consider 
how we get our own needs met, it may just be that someone else in this life is responding to their trust in Jesus as the daily bread, and they're responding to the call, and they're meeting my needs because of what they're doing. As we deepen our faith in Jesus Christ, we're reminded that Jesus is the bread of life. This is the bread that comes to us and sustains us. As I think about Jesus as the bread of life, I'm kind of transported back to being a little child there on the wharf in Seattle. And I realize that Jesus does sustain me and nurtures me and comforts me. And in fact, fills me up to overflowing. And I, I look at what I have and I say, I, I've got so much that I, I've got this bread that I've, I've got to share. I've got to give it away. As we experience the risen living Christ during this Easter season, I invite you to come to an understanding of Jesus Christ as the bread of life. May this bread fill you up and leave you satisfied. Amen.